So, so far we've had a lot to say about the structures of excited states, their unimolecular dynamics, photophysics, and some experimental techniques that are used to probe these processes. And we're finally ready to really make the jump from photophysics and structure to photochemistry and dynamics of photochemical reactions, where photoexcitation causes a chemical change, the cleavage and or formation of chemical bonds. And that's what we're going to look at in general terms in this series of videos before we turn our attention to specific chromophores, specific functional groups, primarily in organic molecules, that engage in reactions that are typical of the general processes that we'll talk about here. I wanted to start by returning to some of the foundational ideas we had about the structures of excited states and thinking about ways we can connect structure to reactivity, especially through this NBO model of orbital structure, which allows us to develop Lewis-type reactivity, you know, curved arrows, pushing electrons-type reactivity paradigms based on the orbital structure of an excited state. So let's now revisit a very important and fundamental idea concerning the electronic configurations of excited state molecules. And this is the simple idea that the natural bond orbital configuration, which can be inferred very often from the Lewis structure of the ground state and a consideration of the orbitals involved in the photo excitation event, can provide us with a zero order guess of the electronic structure of an excited state. And drawing those NBO shapes shows us really where the electrons are located, and in particular, where the electrons in the SOMOs, the singly occupied molecular orbitals, are located in excited states. And I wanted to talk about two general examples of chromophores that we will return to again in more detail in later video series. The first is the alkene and its pi pi star excited state. It's very common that alkene pi pi star states are drawn with two unpaired electrons on the adjacent carbon atoms that are linked by a pi bond in the ground state structure. The basic reason for this is that the two electrons are in two different types of pi type orbitals, a pi bonding orbital and a pi antibonding orbital. And so the two electrons have sort of fundamentally different dynamics. For example, if we look at a three-dimensional structure of the orbitals involved, we can see that one electron is characterized by this distribution between the two carbons in a pi type orbital, right? And we can think of the other electron as residing in a pi star orbital in some sense in the same region of space as the pi electron, but in many ways with, with very different spatial distribution, for example, with the node between the nuclei. And so the alkene pi pi star state as a state consisting of two electrons, both above and below the molecular plane with no density in the molecular plane and existing in somewhat different regions of space is well described by this structure with two unpaired electrons. The carbonyl in pi star structure is another excited state that we can apply this idea to with some fundamental differences from the alkene. So we previously discussed how we could think of the carbonyl in pi star as a structure with two unpaired electrons, one on oxygen and one on carbon, with the pi bond intact via excitation of an n electron to the pi star orbital. These two electrons in this excited state are in very different positions in space and consideration of the shapes of the singly occupied NBOs will give us a sense of this. For example, here's the shape of the carbonyl pi star orbital, and this is where one of those unpaired electrons in this excited state is living, the pi star electron. The n electron, shown here in, in yellow and green, here's the n orbital, is in a very different region of space in the molecular plane as opposed to perpendicular to the molecular plane and on either side of the carbonyl oxygen. And so we would expect very different dynamics for the carbonyl n pi star state with those unpaired electrons now occupying perpendicular orbitals rather than parallel orbitals. All of this information can be gleaned from an understanding of the general NBO orbital shapes and the electron configuration of the excited state in NBO terms. And of course, considering how these singly occupied molecular orbitals overlap also gives us insight into singlet and triplet energies and delta E S T, which we've seen previously. Now, in applying the very general model of photo excitation as kicking an electron up from the HOMO to the LUMO to create two SOMOs, one conclusion we come to is that organic excited states have diradical character. They're what we call 
diradical oids. They're not exactly diradicals in the sense of having two completely independent unpaired electrons, but they're diradical like and the more strongly those electrons are interacting, the less true diradical character we have, but very often as an excited state evolves, for example, back to a ground state potential energy surface, it will pick up diradical character. And so after the photo excitation event, there's this relaxation phase where the diradical loid, R star, evolves into something that is in the vicinity of a ground state potential energy surface. And this state that it evolves to can fall into one of two classes. It can either be a diradical state where the unpaired electrons remain unpaired in orbitals that are either equal or very close in energy. And these may be either singlet or triplet. So we talk about singlet diradicals or triplet diradicals. If the electrons end up paired, which must involve opposite spins, right? Must involve singlet states. We end up at what are called Z states or Zwitter ionic states. These may differ in energy if, for example, it's more stable to place the electrons in the N2 orbital as opposed to N1. And this is a very common situation if we're talking about some kind of polarized chromophore. The D and Z states are going to have very different reactivity, very different dynamics. And so we want to be able to predict where possible whether an excited state will evolve into a Zwitter ion or a diradical state. One thing we can say right off the bat is that a triplet excited state must evolve to a triplet diradical and cannot form a singlet diradical or one of these Zwitter ionic states due to our spin selection rules. However, singlet excited R can form either a Zwitter ionic state, typically the lower in energy will be the favored one, or a diradical state. And what exactly happens is often difficult to predict. We more often want to try to use general mechanistic paradigms to understand when a reaction is likely going through a Z or D state. We'll talk about some of those in future videos. Just to quickly connect this idea that photo excited states are often diradical in nature, we've already seen that a great Lewis structure for the carbonyl excited state is one in which we have two unpaired electrons, a diradical. Those, little, those electrons, however, are relatively close in space and may be interacting fairly profoundly, and so this would be what we would call a diradical oid, a species with diradical character, but strongly interacting electrons. For example, electron-electron repulsion between those two electrons may still be profoundly strong. And of course, we may start in a singlet situation, but inter-system crossing can take us to a triplet situation where we've gone from, for example, electrons with opposite spins to unpaired electrons with parallel spins. And now we're very much in a diradicaloid situation since this triplet diradicaloid is going to have to evolve to a triplet ground state structure. So the singlet here is capable of heading towards a Zwitter ionic state, which actually must be a singlet, or a singlet diradical state, while the triplet excited state must evolve toward a triplet diradical. We often think about Zwitter ionic intermediates in terms of polar resonance forms. And so connecting resonance and photo excitation will help you apply the Lewis model to excited states in a rational way. One place we can start is to return to this idea that photo excitation enables electron transfer, both oxidative and reductive. And so resonance structures that illustrate where negative and positive charges are located in the excited state can give us insight into the locations where electrons are leaving from or going to in cases of photo-induced electron transfer. So for example, here, a molecule like this upon photo excitation, in the singlet excited state where electron pairing is allowed by the opposite spins of the electrons in SOMOS, we can think of the excited state as having the character of this Zwitter ion. And given this Zwitter ionic character, we can understand how and why this molecule is able and willing to give away an electron located at this central carbon. So that, for example, when we put this photo excited molecule in the presence of an electron acceptor like dicyanoanthracene, DCA, we observe an electron transfer process from that central carbon to generate a radical cation. This is nothing more than a photo-induced electron transfer process that we've seen previously. 
And after that radical cation has been generated, if it's treated with a nucleophile, we can get addition processes taking place. And the key to this reactivity really is that photoexcitation causes a polarization of the alkene by exciting an electron from the pi to the pi star orbital. This enables electron transfer, and this increases in importance this Zwitter ionic resonance form and often opens doors to new reactivity, and reactivity that is commonly opposite our expectation based on ground state, for example, Markovnikov's rule, where positive charge prefers to be on the carbon that is most substituted and things like this. The other thing that photoexcitation can do is dramatically alter acidity by changing the locations of charges within a structure. So a molecule like naphthol, for example, 2-naphthol, is moderately acidic at the OH group because of the delocalization of negative charge that happens when we remove a proton from this molecule, that oxygen. However, we can think of photoexcitation as very much sending electron density from the HOMO, which we could argue is associated with the non-bonding lone pair orbital of this hydroxyl group, into the aromatic pi system where we could argue the pi star orbital mostly resides. And so resonance forms where the oxygen is now positive because electron density has shifted into the aromatic ring and the ring is now negative, gain in importance dramatically upon photoexcitation. And this isn't just pushing electrons on paper. We have empirical evidence for this in the form of the pKa's of 2-naphthol and its excited state. And you can see the pKa of the excited 2-naphthol has plummeted. This has become much, much more acidic as a result of photoexcitation. We can trace this effect to the fact that this resonance form with opposite charges and with electron density pushed into the naphthalene ring gains in importance dramatically upon photoexcitation.